Hi, my name is Leticia Rolon and I'm an assistant professor in the Division of Nephrology here at UCSF. And today it's my pleasure to talk to you all about renal physiology uh, condensed for the urologists. And I will uh, concentrate my talk on uh, the topics of clearance as well as electrolyte acid base balance. And so to begin, I have uh, no conflicts of interest to disclose. And uh, my the objectives for this talk are to start with a rapid review of clearance uh, as focusing on the diagnosis and evaluation of an acute kidney injury. Then we will talk about electrolyte balance and then we'll finish off with um, acid base and primarily talking about uh, the RTAs, which are relevant uh, for um, urology practice. And so starting with clearance, um, let's see if we could take you all the way back to medical school and if you can remember the nephron. So the nephron, if, as you recall, is the, is the, each, uh, the, the filtering unit of the kidney. And here we have, uh, we have the Bowman's capsule, which is uh, covering the glomerulus, but right after is the proximal tubule. And this is gonna be our primary site of reabsorption and secretion. This is where the, kind of a lot of the action happens uh, right from the get-go in the, in the nephron. And then our loop of Henle is what we call our primary urine diluting segment. And the reason is because this is the location where we have a lot of our sodium potassium chloride uh, reabsorption. This is where the medullary osmotic gradient gets created, uh, followed by the distal tubule, which is another secondary urine, urine diluting segment, and then finishing uh, with the collecting duct, which is essentially doing a lot of the fine tuning of excretion and here's what we call our urine concentrating segment where also a lot of the reabsorption or not of water uh, will happen. And so when we talk about what are the functions of the kidney, really there's a lot of things that are going on. We have, we start with filtration in the glomerulus and then we have reabsorption, secretion, and then the end excretion. Um, oh, excretion is ultimately what we end up seeing in, in the urine and excretion will be the net balance of all these three things, um, how much of each solute is filtered, how much is reabsorbed, how much is secreted. And this brings us to this, the principle of clearance, um, which is the, when we really talk about the, the, the definition of clearance, it's the volume of plasma from which a substance is completely removed. So here, we're not talking about the clearance, like how much a solute gets removed. No, we're talking about how much volume needs to pass by the kidney in order to fully remove a substance. And so you can imagine that this clearance then is gonna really vary from substance to substance. What if something is not filtered? Then we're saying it's not cleared, right? So things like albumin, albumin is too large to get filtered. And so it, the clearance of albumin is very low. Um, on the other hand, something like, um, like creatinine where a creatinine is completely filtered. The, this, this, there's no mechanism to reabsorb creatinine. All of, the, all of the creatinine that comes to the glomerulus is filtered and just a small amount is actually secreted, but then ultimately what is excreted ends up being essentially the same amount as what is filtered. And this is why we say that creatinine is a good marker for, um, or creatinine clearance is a good marker for the glomerular uh, filtration rate. So because creatinine has this um, uh, these properties and very similar to inulin, but we just don't use inulin in clinical practice um, because it's not an, an endogenous marker like creatinine is. So creatinine, when the muscle produces it, um, the kidney gets rid of all of it. 100% of it gets filtered, a tiny amount gets secreted, but essentially all that's excreted is pretty reflected, uh, reflective of the glomerular filtration rate. And that's why creatinine clearance is an, uh, gives us an estimation of the GFR. You may realize that this is why we wouldn't use something like sodium clearance as an estimation of GFR, because although sodium is almost 100% filtered in the glomerulus, it's also 
like 99% reabsorbed. And so the amount of sodium that is excreted does not reflect the glomerular filtration rate. And so the, it makes uh, this these properties of sodium make it uh, unusable to estimate the GFR. And so really we, we, we use the serum creatinine, uh, th these properties of serum creatinine are what make it uh, the most useful. And so then um, serum creatinine is um, in and of itself won't tell us the GFR. If we were to measure creatinine clearance with the 24-hour urine collection, yes, that will give us an estimation of GFR. But um, when you, as you all know, in clinical practice, we don't do that. We don't check 24-hour creatinines on our patients on a daily basis. And so what we do is uh, estimate the GFR from a serum creatinine. And how this came to be is because um, essentially when in looking for um, endogenous bio, endogenous um, substances like creatinine that are completely filtered and then almost all excreted with only a small amount of secretion, um, essentially this is what we wanted in order to be able to have a useful measure of, uh, of GFR that we could quickly get. And so population studies that started it since the 70s brought in and created these um, really complex equations where they did uh, essentially serum creatinine measurements and then they compared them to not only inulin but also, but also iothalamate infusion Fusions. And, and then uh, these really complex uh, algorithmic uh, um, equations were created to then spit out an estimation of GFR, this number. But you'll see that over time, so the first, um, the first equation to estimate GFR was developed in the 70s, and then it took almost 30 years to get the next one. Um, and then subsequently, the one that we had been using and the one that the UCSF lab used was this, um, the CKD epi equation. And the things that you'll notice in these equations, these subsequent ones after the original one that was created, was that they um, substituted this race coefficient. And why did they do that? Uh, so the reason why this happened, um, and I have here a slide to, there's, I apologize, there's a lot of text on this slide, but I just want to um, really explain why, why did this come about? Because really this only happens in the US. And when you go to other countries, you don't see See a race coefficient that gets put in um, for um, that gets put in to estimate GFR uh, from a serum creatinine, and the reason is for there, there's a lot of complex uh, social um, uh, social and uh, social factors that led to this, and also a lot of um, uh, the examples of structural racism that led to this. But ultimately, what led what led for us to this happen is where these population studies where race was self-reported, so patients self-reported this, and uh, essentially when they compared uh, uh, GFRs for different uh, patients based on a serum creatinine, they found that people who self-identified as African-American tended to have higher GFRs for a given the serum creatinine level. That, however, again, this was not then replicated in other places, or other countries around the world. This was not then shown, and uh, but we continue to use this here. But this is problematic because this doesn't account for, uh, for example, for patients who are of mixed race, patients who maybe have a different um, uh, identify in a, a differently. And again, because race is a social construct, there's no biological basis. It created this problematic and very confusing algorithm that ultimately this um, led to a lot of um, disconcerting questions from patients. Um, here on the right, what you'll see is the typical way that our GFRs get reported based on the serum creatinine. And you see that it, uh, we get a uh, number for estimated GFR if non-African American versus African American. And uh, many times for myself and other colleagues, and um, I can imagine even uh, own uh, family uh, members of mine and, and friends ask like, well, why is it like this? What if I'm not I'm not African American, but I'm not. But uh, I'm also, you know, what if I'm Asian? Like, which one do I use? Which one applies to me? And so, essentially, it, it led to um, a lot of things that we couldn't really explain because um, the creatinine, in and of itself, is a is 
produced by muscle. And so uh, there's a lot of conditions that affect muscle production. And so if you have a, um, a patient who has a lot of muscle for other reasons, but nothing to do with this uh, social construct of race, their GFR may be overestimated or underestimated by this, by using this, uh, this framework. And so, and at the same time, underestimation of, uh, of GFR can lead to uh, inappropriate dosing of antibiotics, inappropriate stoppage of medications that are very important, as in particular medications like metformin. And so a lot of, um, a lot of problematic um, issues came about by doing this differential, um, uh, this differential um, uh, calculation of GFR. And all this to say that if we understand how the kidney processes creatinine and we understand what are other conditions and how our patients, um, that how their health is, how stable they have been over time, that is what is actually the most helpful in terms of using a serum creatinine. Because um, if we feel that a serum creatinine in a patient who uh, appears to have a low muscle mass, then we may want to use some other markers. So we may want to use something like a cystatin C, which is another endogenous marker that is almost 100% filtered and, uh, and is produced by all cells in the body, not just muscle. Um, these are all um, uh, now new tools that we can think of using in patients where we think that the creatinine may be either under or overestimating the GFR. And so over, um, you all probably heard about the movements that are have been going on across, um, across the country to remove this race coefficient from uh, the GFR. And here at UCSF, the way that the creatinine uh, or the, the creatinine is used to estimate GFR is that now we have this um, uh, high estimate and low estimate, which you know, some may make the argument, well, we're still kind of using the same race coefficient now is just hidden, which is true. Um, now it's not labeled as such, uh, but we're still kind of inherently using it. But what this is supposed to do and what we hope is the trend for more labs, including labs at non-academic institutions, but in private labs that it's probably where the majority of the, our, uh, the patients and uh, our patients are getting their labs drawn, that they that this um, high versus low estimate would, it should not be linked to this uh, social construct of race. It should be linked to the patient. It should be linked to um, a, a physician should see this creatinine, this range of GFRs, and, and try to make it a, a guess as to what is what's most, um, that makes the most sense. Like what, where do I think my patient lies? And really at the end of the day, it's not, um, it, it doesn't even really make sense to hinge on one creatinine value and say like, oh, this is the GFR for my patient based on this one creatinine. No, what's really overall most helpful is following a patient's trends. And I'll talk about that shortly. But um, but why is this important? Why are we measuring creatinine all the time? Well, because like we already mentioned, creatinine for us is a measure of the uh, of um, of the glomerular filtration rate. Essentially, how much is the kidney actually um, actually filtering? And this is where I use this analogy to our patients, saying um, uh, the kidney is the washing machine of the body, and really what we want to know is how many drops of blood per minute is this kidney filtering. And when a kidney is injured. Um, um, when there's an acute kidney injury, then we know that there is this drop in the GFR. When we talk about AKI, we diagnose it because the creatinine goes up, urine output goes down. At the end of the day, what both these things are trying to tell us is that the GFR has dropped. And it's now our job to figure out why the GFR has slowed down. Why is the kidney now not filtering as much blood as it was before? And remember that the kidney is kind of a greedy organ. It gets about 25% of the cardiac output. So it's used to getting a lot of perfusion. And so um, for us, um, really a lot of what we see in, especially in inpatient settings, is that there's a, most of the time a drop in GFR either because um, there has been a drop in, in uh, uh, perfusion pressure to the kidney or, or um, also blockage of urine output. Um, and so I have here the definition for AKI, but again, this is 
uh, using an imperfect marker of serum creatinine of 0 0.3, uh, uh, 0 0.3 milligrams per deciliter rise within 48 hours. And this may not, a patient may be an AKI, but if they don't have a lot of muscle mass, they may not mount this response. And it may be that the drop in urine output is the first sign that we get that a patient is actually having an acute kidney injury. But again, the most important thing is to pick up on the fact that your patient is having a drop in the GFR. Now, to get a little bit more technical, we say we like to then um, uh, the subcategorize an acute kidney injury as non-oliguric or oliguric, meaning that a patient's urine output is less than half a liter per day, or that it's anuric AKI. And this is helpful because an anuric patient is going to have a GFR of zero, regardless of what the serum creatinine is telling you. Because recall that serum creatinine takes a while to be produced, so it may be a few days before the creatinine peaks at the, you know, at the level that the patient is able to mount. And, but if the patient is not making urine, that GFR is zero. So it doesn't really matter what the, um, what the labs are saying. And so, um, and, and this is very common to see in the hospital, about 20% of patients will develop an AKI. And uh, we now know that uh, developing an AKI in the hospital is a risk factor, not only for increased morbidity and mortality, but also um, for prolonged length of stay, um, as well, and just um, all in the end also can lead to development of chronic kidney disease. And so very, very important to pick up on, uh, on a patient having an acute kidney injury so that we could do the proper workup. And so I like to um, describe the workup of acute kidney injury as the obvious, the usual, and then some other, then what else do we test? And again, bringing you back to another algorithm, you may remember that we, our main framework for thinking about acute kidney injury is we think about a pre-renal acute kidney injury and, or post-renal or intra-renal. And remembering that pre-renal is essentially anything that leads to a drop in uh, in perfusion pressure to the kidney. And we just said the kidney is very greedy. It gets a lot of blood all the time. If all of a sudden it doesn't get what it's used to, it's going to freak out. And when the pre-renal injury is, is prolonged, then they could then lead to an intrarenal injury. You get intrinsic damage to the, to the kidney. And same with post-renal. So post-renal is essentially anywhere past um, getting to the ureter where urine can no longer flow out of the body. It starts backing up into the kidney. The pyramids here get completely dilated, get filled with urine. All the cortex and all of the, where the filtering happens here, um, the, the cortical tissue gets completely compressed with urine and so filtration can't happen. And similarly with post-renal or an obstructive AKI, prolonged obstruction could then also lead to intrinsic disease. And so a lot of the things that I just described, you can gather from just the clinical history. So again, the obvious in terms of the workup is looking at the baseline creatinine, reviewing medications, especially what's been going on with the patient in the hospital, if this is in the inpatient setting, recent events in patients who are being seen in clinic, and looking at vital signs, trending blood pressures, trending weights, all of that it can give a lot of good information as to what may be going on with the kidney. And then you'll see that the next the next set of tests are all urine tests. And now I really like, I'm going to steal this. I learned this from, uh, from Twitter because uh, nephrology is actually, I'm very proud of that. Nephrology has a strong nephro Twitter presence. And um, now they, we call this the liquid kidney biopsy because the urine really is what gives us a hint as to what's going on uh, inside the kidney. It gives us a lot of really helpful information. And then renal ultrasound, I always advocate to get that, even if we're not suspecting an obstruction. Why? Because it gives us a lot of information on the size of the kidney, um, echogenicity of the cortex. Can this patient may actually, may they have chronic kidney disease, not, um, not acute kidney injury. And then additional tests, mostly when thinking, and, and here I'm talking specifically about blood tests like serologies, um, you know, a lot of people will like uh, 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 just instinctively send HIV, hepatitis serologies, all these things. That's really only in the case if we're suspecting a glomerular etiology or things like rhabdo, um, then yes, we could send other blood tests. But for the most part, we're going to get the majority of, uh, of our information here from these first two.
And I really want to advocate for um, creatograms. So um, I don't know if this is a real word or if I made it up, but uh, uh, our electronic medical record system has a amazing function to be able to graph creatinines. And this is actually one of the first things that I do in any patient that I'm seeing, not only for the first time, but even in subsequent visits is uh, understanding the history of this kidney. Like, um, yes, this uh, the creatinine is elevated, the creatinine is abnormal in all of these patients, but there's, um, you can see there's three very different stories that are told with all of these. So here, what you're seeing is the blue and the green lines are the upper and lower limits of normal in the lab. And then the purple ones are our patient's values. And you could see that the first graph here, this patient, yes, has had an elevated creatinine for a long time, but you could see graphically here that this patient is actually quite stable, as opposed to this patient here who had a creatinine in, um, in, a, in a normal range for a long time, and then all of a sudden has just experienced this progressive increase in creatinine. And so this is obviously somebody that um, we're very worried about. And then this one here is um, a, a, an example of a patient who was, suffered an acute kidney injury. So an event happened here, the creatinine went up, was getting better, a second insult happened, and then the creatinine went up again, had plateaued, and again, something happened here, and then it went up. So this is what I mean that this is really helpful. It tells a, a, a very um, interesting story as to what, what may have happened to the kidney, and also gives us a hint as to where we should be looking in the medical record, um, because uh, whatever happened to irritate the kidney is always going to be uh, one or two days before the actual rise in creatinine uh, that we see. So really important to do this. Um, when looking at patients who have uh, have had a drop in the GFR. And then now moving on to our liquid biopsy, looking at the urine is just so important. And our all our lab technicians are trained in urine microscopy, just like they are when you order a CBC with a peripheral smear. Ordering a urinalysis with uh, with microscopy it is a, it also is a technician who's been trained in this and can give you additional information. So if you look at what um, the urinalysis gives you, it gives you information on specific gravity, which is how concentrated the urine is. Uh, urine pH is most more helpful in terms of uh, differentiating between different RTAs. But then um, look at these next two go together when we're looking for um, etiologies of uh, or glomerular etiologies of a of kidney disease, so or of an acute kidney injury. Um, because we know that protein and blood are too large, they should not be getting filtered. We should not see them in the urine. If we see them, it could there could be this could be a glomerular etiology. The things to remember about this is that. Only, alb only urine albumin will turn protein positive on UA. And um, so, and there are other proteins, which I'll talk about shortly, that um, can uh, lead to an elevated urine protein creatinine ratio, but is not albumin and, uh, and may not turn the UA positive. So always important to look at other, um, if we're suspecting a glomerular etiology, to looking at the actual um, urine protein to creatinine ratios. But the if, if the urine protein is positive, positive on a UA, this is albumin. For blood, however, um, what turns uh, blood positive on UA is either hemoglobin or myoglobin. And so um, uh, a patient who has uh, rhabdomyolysis and is releasing myoglobin into, um, uh, into the circulation, this will, all, and it's in the urine, myoglobin will turn uh, the blood positive on UA. Ketones are a marker that the patient has shifted to a fatty acid metabolism. Um, Billy Rubin, mostly in situations of patients who have liver disease, uh, glucose primarily in patients uh, who have diabetes or uh, hyperglycemia, um, sometimes in the setting of steroids, things like that. And then this leukocyte esterase and nitrite. So leuk esterase is a breakdown product of white blood cells, whereas nitrite is a breakdown product of bacteria. And so when both of these are positive together, it raises the index of suspicion that um, there may be, what we're dealing with here is maybe an infection, maybe a pyelonephritis. Um, if only leukocyte esterase is positive, uh, meaning there's white blood cells in the urine, nitrite is negative, and then you sent a urine culture and the urine culture is negative, then maybe you want to look at medications or other possible etiologies like interstitial nephritis, um, which is one of our intrarenal causes. And then what we see on urine microscopy are things like uh, cellular components, red blood cells, white blood cells, 
casts or crystals. And here on this in this uh, diagram here, what we're seeing, these casts essentially is exactly as the name says, it's a mold of the inside of the tubule. And these molds get formed, the matrix are these TAM Horsfall proteins, which are tubular proteins, which is one of the other proteins I, I was mentioning that um, are sometimes detected in the urine, not albumin. And this um, and these, um, there's this collagenous matrix, essentially when something is in high concentration in the tubules, like white blood cells, red blood cells, they can form these molds or casts, and then we see them out in the urine. Um, the way that our lab here at UCSF, I don't know in other places, but the way that it gets reported is um, as granular casts um, for some of the, um, when we've, we're talking about acute tubular necrosis, like ATN, um, these get reported as granular casts. When you look at high power, there's no red blood cells, there's no white blood cells. It's really just little granulars and granules, and it could either be finely or coarsely granular. And when you see this, this is pretty much pathognomonic for acute tubular necrosis. If you have a cellular cast with red blood cells, that raises uh, the suspicion for a glomerular nephritis. A white blood cell cast will raise uh, suspicion for an interstitial nephritis. And so, um, um, so this is, as you can see, like we get a lot of information from the urine. So super important to send this off uh, when you see a patient with AKI. And so um, more about this urine protein. So again, there's different, different sources of, of uh, protein. So um, there's normal proteins that a little bit of albumin does get filtered, mostly gets reabsorbed, but there could be overflow um, uh, proteinuria. This is primarily, we see this a lot in um, situations situations of, uh, of pregnancy. Uh, patients who are pregnant who have now hyperfiltration in the kidney, can we sometimes see um, increased uh, albuminuria. And, um, but uh, usually it's in the range of um, um, uh, still microalbuminuria, less than 300 milligrams uh, per gram. And so um, for these patients, usually once, um, uh, once we do a further evaluation and once the patient's no longer pregnant, they, it usually goes away. For glomerular sources, here's where, where um, we like to fractionate um, to confirm that the uh, urine protein is indeed coming from, uh, from the glomerulus. So sometimes what happens um, in the evaluation of AKI, somebody may send a urine protein creatinine ratio and it becomes back elevated. And so then we get the question like, is this a, a, a GN? Is this a glomerular disease? And what I have here is an example of exactly that that happened in a patient in the hospital who uh, clinically had ATN. Uh, but what happened is that, so if you see the protein creatinine ratio here, it's extremely elevated. It's like 4.5, so 4,500 milligrams. So really, really high proteinuria. But then when we compared it, when we fraction, uh, fractionated that urine protein, we saw that albumin made up very, very little of this protein. So you, essentially, this is not a glomerular source of proteinuria. This was a tubular source of proteinuria. And that gets to this diagram here, which is that sometimes when patients get acute tubular necrosis in the hospital, these uh, tubular proteins that um, sometimes get absorbed, um, not only get absorbed, but also tubules can um, even produce them. What will happen is that when you don't have functioning tubules, you're just going to get all this leaked out in the urine. And so this does not signify a glomerular disease because these are tubular proteins. So um, always helpful to check uh, both of these. And, um, and just to remember that usually in normal physiologic states, the normal urine protein excretion is that we get a little bit, it should be less than 150 milligrams per day. And of that, urine albumin should be less than 30. So anything more than that, we should look at other um, uh, potential etiologies. But, but just a take home point here is that ATN can lead to tubular proteinuria. So if your patient has more of a clinical picture of ATN and the urine protein creatinine ratio is elevated, don't think that you're missing the glomerular disease. If you, there are other reasons to suspect one, like, oh, there's true uh, hematuria, like dysmorphic RBCs, then yes, obviously, um, then you, you would go down that route. Um, but otherwise, it's normal to have elevated UPCRs in, in ATN. And now, um, urine electrolytes, what is the most helpful? 
For me, uh, for as a nephrologist, really the most helpful is just checking a urine sodium and a urine chloride, because what this is going to tell us is that, um, and and I have yet to calculate a fina as a nephrologist, like, and essentially the reason why is because the information that we're trying to gather is just a patient who has a low GFR should have triggered RAS. So when the renal and uh, angiotensin aldosterone system is activated, uh, that function of aldosterone is to reabsorb sodium from the collecting duct. And so we should not be detecting sodium in the urine if this tubule is functioning. And so if you check a urine sodium and it's low, then maybe you could think like, okay, this is uh, potentially a patient who's pre-renal. Uh, they may respond to fluids. However, if the, if the urine sodium is not low uh, when it should be because the, the GFR is low, especially when a patient is oliguric, then that to us is a sign that these tubular cells are damaged. So we've probably now entered an ATN phase of the kidney injury. And so it's not that the sodium shouldn't have been reabsorbed, it's just that it couldn't be. And so that may mean that um, we could try to resuscitate, but we don't want to go crazy because it's it's possible that the patient may not respond and may actually may, may need Lasix to kind of help augment the function of the of, of the nephrons here. And then, you know, getting a little bit more complicated is just this idea of thinking about, about the intrarenal causes. So Pre, uh, pre and post uh, renal etiologies of AKI are pretty kind of like our low hanging fruit, like pretty easy to diagnose and and treat. On the other hand, uh, in thinking about intrarenal causes gets very more um, um, uh, could get more complicated. But really having a framework to think about this is also very helpful. And the framework is just thinking about the intrarenal structures, which is there are uh, these four categories, which are the interstitium the glomerulus, the vasculature, and the tubules. And so what are the primary diseases that we see in each category? Well, for tubules, we're gonna, if, here we're talking about ATN, essentially, acute tubular necrosis. For glomerulus, uh, we're talking about GNs, interstitium, either acute or chronic interstitial nephritis. And then for the vascular here, we're talking mostly about thrombotic microangiopathies, which we see in patients who are pregnant, uh, who develop preeclampsia, um, or uh, also in patients who are uh, on a lot of these new um, medications to treat malignancies can trigger thrombotic microangiopathies, and then also malignant hypertension can do this as well. And a and, and lot less frequently, we don't see as much as uh, a thrombolic disease um, anymore. Now, I'm going to primarily talk about the hospital setting. When you have an AKI, we, we always get this question like, oh, why does nephrology? We always say that it's ATN. Well, the reason is because it's are going to be almost 90% of the causes of AKI in the hospital. And that's because the tubules are very, very, uh, they're very sensitive. And so um, we, there's a lot of data to show all the different ways in which the tubules can get damaged. Um, and one of the, even a normal tensive ischemic acute renal failure. So the patient was in, came in febrile, we were suspecting sepsis, but the blood pressure was never really that low. But if that patient was normally hypertensive, even a relative drop in blood pressure is going to trigger a tubular necrosis. We talk a lot about a contrast uh, uh, associated AKI, which we now know that is not a significant contributor to uh, prolonged kidney disease, but there is a correlation with increasing creatinine after uh, con uh, iodinated contrast. But the, the debate goes on as to how clinically significant this is. And then sepsis as well can lead to ATN. And you again, you don't have to ha even have a uh, hypotension. There are some um, uh, uh, bacterial epitopes and uh, cytokines that we know that also lead to tubular necrosis. And not to mention all the, uh, the multitude of drugs that we give in the hospital that could also then cause uh, tubular necrosis. And so just to, um, you know, kind of say like, what, what are the things that we think about when we see these patients in the hospital? And here you'll see a picture of a, a renal ultrasound. And um, what I wanted to depict is that, yes, of course, obviously here on the left uh, image here, we see a picture of a normal sized kidney. And on the right, we see a, a, a kidney that is affected with hydronephrosis. But the thing that I want to point out here is just how well demarcated the contours in this kidney are and how easy it is to measure the size. 
it's if you may um, have noticed it's not as straightforward and we don't always get measurements on uh, kidney size on ct scans and that's just because it's technically challenging and it's much more easy to get on ultrasound which is one of the reasons why we it's part of it should be part of all our workups for aki because um, we not only rule out obstruction but we look at size we could look at cortical echo texture and it could help us in prognosticating a patient a uh, patient who comes in with a severe aki even if they're anuric but their kidney look pretty healthy on uh, imaging, then we have a higher um, uh, a higher probability that this, this patient uh, can recover, as opposed to a patient who comes in with a severe AKI and the kidneys look atrophic or small, very uh, echogenic, we may say like this recovery may actually take a long time. So a lot of helpful data here. And not that I want to preach to the choir here about um, obstruction leading to AKI. Um, again, we know that uh, usually obstruction, especially unilateral obstruction, should not lead to AKI because we have um, the uh, second kidney to compensate. But it is important to keep in mind that if the contralateral kidney already has underlying CKD from another cause or maybe the patient has multiple causes of AKI, like they came in with an obstructive nephrolithiasis and, and, and uh, urosepsis. Then they may have ATN from, their, uh, uh, for, from the infection, and then this obstruction, all of this together could then, could have, even if it's unilateral, could lead to a drop in the GFR. And there's also this concept, sometimes we see this where we think um, we get imaging and there's no other cause. We can't figure out why this patient has an acute kidney injury, but on imaging, we see a little bit of hydronephrosis. And sometimes the question is, is that enough hydronephrosis to cause an AKI? Well, there is this concept, again, of uh, reflex anuria. So this is a, a, a something that happens essentially that due to this urinary reflex, the ureteral irritation stimulates sensory fibers that then causes this reflex renal arterial vasoconstriction. And so um, I don't know if this is like a compensatory or protective mechanism, but we see this happening. And so the patients will stop making urine. And in, in addition, there could be also a mechanical obstruction um, secondary to um, ureteral edema from manipulation or again, a passing stone, things like that, depending on how severe um, uh, or how, um, uh, how severe the, the obstruction was. And it really, I just want to make this note that the grade of hydronephrosis correlates very poorly to the severity of obstruction because sometimes a patient can have very little hydronephrosis on ultrasound, but that doesn't mean they don't have a severe obstruction. It may just mean that they have this reflex anuria, they're not producing urine. It's the urine that causes that hydronephrosis. And so if they're anuric, they may, you may not see as significant of a, of a, a dilation in the kidney. Um, or at the opposite, we may see a really severe hydronephrosis and, and the AKI may not be that severe. May, sometimes patients are on diuretics, so they produce a lot of urine. And um, so we may not be seeing um, a, a really elevated uh, creatinine, even though the, um, the, the hydronephrosis seems severe. And also the duration of obstruction. Um, patients who are chronic, have a chronic urinary obstruction, when you go in to relieve it at, at that point, essentially it can become um, very difficult for the kidney then to return to its uh, uh, previous size. And so, um, so this is all that I wanted to say about acute kidney injury. I am going to move on to um, uh, electrolyte and, and acid-base balance. And uh, here I want to talk about my most favorite electrolyte, which is sodium, just because it's so tricky. Um, and because we really, really, when we think about, and I, and we should not think about sodium disorders because these essentially don't really exist. Whenever we see uh, a, a dysnatremia, so hypo or hypo, hypo or hypernatremia, it's a disorder of water. If you have hyponatremia, there's too much water. If you have hypernatremia, you don't have enough water. And so, and water is regulated by ADH, antidiuretic hormone. And so really the crux of diagnosing a sodium disorder is figuring out why ADH is there or not. And so let's review a little bit about ADH. So um, here on the on this graph here on the right, we have uh, plasma AVP or arginine vasopressin, another name for ADH, just you know to make things more complicated for fun. Um, you'll see here that what causes the more drastic percent change 
for, um, for ADH uh, production or ADH concentration in the blood is isovolemic, so no change in volume status, but osmotic increase, an increase in osmolality. So here we're talking about situations where you eat something very salty or you haven't drank water in a while, your osmolality, your serum osmolality increases, you release ADH, ADH triggers thirst, you drink water, sodium comes down. And so, um, so that's the normal physiology. However, we have this other condition with the blue dots here, with you see that it's isotonic, so there's been no change to the serum osmolality, but there's volume depletion. So a patient who is the, the body or the kidney stink that is volume depleted or the effective circulating volume is low, that's going to trigger ADH release as well. And so here we think about our patients who suffer from heart failure. So heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, that low EF is going to trick the kidney into thinking that it's, it's, there's hypovolemia, I need all the fluids I could possibly hold on to. So not only do I trigger RAS, but I also then trigger ADH to hold on to water. And then this, the patients drink water because ADH is a, the thirst hormone. And then that dilutes down the sodium and you get hyponatremia. And so really, really important to think of um, think of sodium uh, uh, or dysnatremia as hypohypernatremia as uh, being a problem of water. And so uh, if we go here to the next um, uh, slide, here was, is exactly what I was uh, just saying. Hyponatremia, there's a water excess. Hypernatremia, there's a water deficit. And so why is it that we would develop a, a, a situation of water excess? Well, here's where we look at IV fluids, PO intake. We want to make sure that this is not a condition of like um, what we call psychogenic polydipsia or like water intoxication over the drinking so much water that we're overwhelming the kidney's ability to excrete that water, and then address any cause why ADH could be around. So you have to look at the patient's volume status. Do What, what was their access to water? A patient who is hypo, uh, who is actually hypovolemic, hypotensive, tachycardic, because they've been having a lot of diarrhea or um, yeah, like a gastroenteritis, but they all that they've been doing is drinking water because they can't keep any food down, their, take, their intake of water to solute is going to be off. They're going to have a hyponatremia. So we, so looking at volume status, looking at vital signs, orthostatics, looking at other things that trigger ADH, especially if they appear euvolemic. So things like nausea, pain, um, looking for any CNS or pulmonary lesions, which are can independently produce ADH, also um, very important. When we're evaluating a patient with hyponatremia, it's really, really important to get not only urine osmolality, because urine osmolality or our specific gravity or how concentrated our urine is, is going to tell us how much ADH is around. In a patient who has low serum sodium concentration, so they're hyponatremic, if their urine is really concentrated, there's a problem because in any patient who has hyponatremia, the urine should be maximally dilute. That kidney should be getting rid of all the water that's in the excess water that's in the circulation that's leading to this dilution of sodium. And so if the urine is concentrated, that means there's ADH around, uh, antidiuretic hormone, so it's reabsorbing all that water and, and making this problem of hyponatremia worse. And so we have to figure out why that is. And one thing that can really help us is looking at this uh, the free water clearance. So what do we mean by free water clearance? This uh, looks um, or sounds a lot more complicated than it is. It's really just looking at the urine sodium and the urine potassium and comparing it to the serum sodium. If the urine sodium and the urine potassium is greater than the serum sodium, that's going to give you, th that's telling you there is a lot of electrolytes in the urine. There's not a lot of water. We're in a situation of negative free water clearance. And this means that there is a lot of ADH around, urine osmolality is high, and water reabsorption is high. So this patient, it's unlikely that fluid restriction alone is going to help treat them because they're reabsorbing any, even if they, if you flu, if you fluid restrict them to half a liter, this kidney is telling you, I'm going to reabsorb all that water. And so um, uh, it's not trying to trick us. It's going to give us this information when we check the urine osmolality and so, and, and the urine sodium and the urine potassium. So if those numbers are really high compared to the serum, 
then we're going to have to look for other treatments for the hyponatremia, like well, how can we shed off this ADH? In patients who are hypervolemic, hyponatremic, so heart failure, um, cirrhosis, um, uh, end-stage kidney disease, where uh, essentially the patient is super volume overloaded um, and, and they're hyponatremic, it's because the kidney is not sensing that circulation, either from heart failure, low oncotic pressure in cirrhosis, or in CKD, low GFR. The kidney doesn't know why, but it just feels there's not a, it's not receiving circulation. It's triggered RAS. It's triggered ADH, patients get thirsty, they drink water, they get hyponatremic. So in patients who are hypervolemic, we're going to diurese. If they're hypovolemic, we would give fluids to shut off the ADH. And if they're euvolemic, we have to figure out why else the ADH is there and why we and, and figure out how we can potentially um, uh, block it. And then hypernatremia is a lot more straightforward because it's just somebody who hasn't had access to water. A lot of the times this happens in, um, in patients who are in the ICU, who are intubated, elderly patients uh, who become delirious um, from another condition, even a, even a UTI can lead to this. And you always wanna also just look at, especially in patients in the hospital, look at urine output, look at GI output, look at drains, and it definitely do not try to fix hypernatremia by giving normal saline. Sometimes folks think that, um, well, if the sodium is 160 and NS, the concentration is 154 uh, milliequivalents per liter. So if I give NS, it's going to bring the sodium down. No, because remember that in this situation, these patients are, um, it, what they're missing is free water. And so by giving sodium in solutes, uh, sodium in solutes with sodium chloride and then water, you're just essentially, you're going to keep things the same. What we want is to give water to dilute down the sodium. Okay. And so moving on to potassium. So both for hypo and hyperkalemia, Essentially, there's only three mechanisms by which these problems uh, occur, either low or high potassium. And it's either the, a problem with the intake, a problem with the secretion, or the shifting um, in, in and out of cells. And so in hypokalemia, you know, really restricted intake is, it, it would have to be very severe in order for hypokalemia to develop just because the kidney is so good at holding on to potassium or if you're having excess losses. So here we're getting into situations where patients who have severe diarrhea, that you can lose potassium that way, or an ostomy, um, things like that. Uh, but uh, from renal losses here, the primary etiology is almost always diuretics. Di a lot of our diuretics are potassium wasting, so we can see hypokalemia from that. And then shifting into the cells from alkalosis or medications like insulin or butyrol can cause this as well. Now on the opposite end, hyperkalemia is it also uh, occurs from uh, can occur from excess intake, but really only if there's low GFR. So really, these two have to uh, be occurring together because if you have normal secretion of potassium, if you have excess intake, the kidney is just going to get rid of more. But if you have low GFR and excess intake, this will lead to hyperkalemia. And then the shifting out of cells or leakage out of cells. So pseudo hyperkalemia usually in hemolysis. Um, acidosis and then other medications can cause this as well. And so the treatment for this, uh, for hypokalemia is essentially giving IV or oral potassium. The route depends on just the severity of the hypokalemia. And the dose is difficult to get exactly right. There's some algorithms, but it's just, um, uh, you know, uh, and also taking into account ongoing losses, but safe to estimate that about 10 milliequivalents of potassium um, will increase um, uh, the, the potassium by 0.1, or for every 0.1 drop in serum potassium, you should be repleting by 10 milliequivalents. Um, and uh, if given IV, we, unless you have a central line, usually it goes in pretty slowly. And then you just have to check frequently. For the treatment for hyperkalemia, it's a little bit more complicated because I feel like sometimes a lot of times we see patients with hyperkalemia and the first thing they get is calcium. The calcium is doing nothing to that potassium. Calcium is just stabilizing the myocardium. But really what we want to do is, especially if there's EKG changes, we want to shift that potassium into the cells. And insulin, glucose, bicarb, albuterol, these are all our shifting therapies. In order to then remove potassium from the body, if the patient has urine output, you may use diuretics. 
um, in, in the GI tract, um, you can use um, some of these medications that bind potassium in the gut or in patients who uh, maybe had recent bowel surgery, you can't have an ileus, or if they don't have urine output, then really it's just um, dialysis. For magnesium, a very similar approach uh, as to potassium. Think about intake versus the losses. You don't have this uh, idea of shifting between cells. But the thing to remember here is that for magnesium is that medications play a huge role. So diuretics also waste magnesium. And then a lot of um, anti, um, uh, um, um, what do we call, um, uh, like in indigestion medications, like Pepto-Bismol, milk of magnesia, Mylanta, a lot of these have a lot of magnesium in them. And really, we don't really see hypermagnesemia that frequently um, unless the GFR is low. So similar to hyperkalemia. Okay. And the most important pearl here to remember is that repletion is uh, required in order to be able to correct both hypokalemia and hypocalcemia because uh, magnesium is a, is a factor in the, in the tubule that allows for the correction of these lab values as well. Calcium and phosphorus, I will not go into this diagram because it's very complicated. It's meant to be complicated to depict that calcium and phosphorus are in a completely different field, not as straightforward as potassium and magnesium. And that's because there are a lot of hormones that play a role in uh, calcium and phosphorus balance, including parathyroid hormone, um, one alpha hydroxylase that helps um, uh, uh, activate vitamin D. And, um, and so it's a lot of um, this interplay between the kidneys and, um, uh, and, the, and bone metabolism as well. But uh, if I can summarize it in just one little um, diagram here is just to know that in our patients who have um, low GFR, what happens is that the first thing that happens is that because the gut absorbs phosphorus in an unregulated way, this high phosphorus level will essentially also lead to hypocalcemia because you uh, the, the phosphorus binds calcium and decrease serum uh, calcium levels. At the same time, a diseased kidney doesn't produce uh, activated vitamin D, which is the 125 hydroxy vitamin D. So without vitamin D, you don't get calcium absorption in the gut. So another reason why calcium is low and this low calcium then triggers parathyroid hormone to become elevated. So it's the secondary hyperparathyroidism. And then and that, that PTH is going to chew away at bone basically to try to increase calcium levels. And this is what leads to um, um, what we call mineral bone disease um, in patients with kidney disease. And then, um, you know, how do we use this electrolyte balance in, um, in stone disease? Uh, it's really, really important to remember that most of the stones in, um, that we, that you will treat are calcium oxalate. And these are usually, they, it happens because of low, either low citrate or high oxalate in the urine leads to this supersaturation of crystals. And so um, what you see here on the right is something called this test called the Litholink, which is an amazing test, really great at um, analyzing all the electrolytes in the urine and looking at pH and a, a lot of other things, including uric acid, um, oxalate, calcium, sodium, all these things. And it'll give you um, essentially a readout as to what are the risk factors for your patients uh, developing um, uh, stones. And um, so because the majority of the stones are going to be calcium oxalate, uh, and, and a lot of the causes low citrate, what we really are go-to is uh, this need to alkalinize the urine. And uh, we do that by using something called uh, potassium citrate is usually what, um, what, we, what we use. And um, it's super important to lower urinary sodium. And we do that by restricting, um, restricting sodium in the diet. We really ask our patients who form a lot of kidney stones is really limit the salt, increase the urine volume. The number one risk factor for stone formation is low urine volume. So you want to aim for two, two and a half liters of urine output per day, and then sodium restriction. Interestingly, you know, um, urine, um, uh, we want to lower urine calcium. Usually we do this with thiazide diuretics, but we don't typically tell patients to restrict calcium in the diet because, again, because of this complex mechanism of the uh, 
with calcium and parathyroid hormone. Uh, it, it, essentially, if you just restrict calcium in the diet and you drop serum calcium levels, then you can lead to bone disease, and we don't want that. And so, and and because the kidney, if there unless there's like super high urinary calcium wasting, the kidneys, the it's not really the urine calcium that's the problem. It's either the urine sodium, the citrate, or the oxalate. And so these are the things um, that we focus on um, for electrolyte balance in, in stone disease. Then to finish off, I just want to talk briefly about acid base. Um, in urology, the most common thing that you'll see is metabolic acidosis. It would be rare to see uh, for you to see a metabolic alkalosis. Um, and what is even the most common thing that you will see are uh, is a non anion gap metabolic acidosis. And either from an RTA or from the our, um, ileal conduits. And I like this, I really like this picture that shows the entire um, gastrointestinal tract and the different pH at different levels, because then this could help uh, for you, like as you're building um, neobladders, things like that, um, understand kind of how the urine will change based on, on the new reservoir. And so um, the this consideration for ileal conduits is that you have this intact urinary sodium in excretion, but the urinary creatinine uh, may be impacted by this intestinal absorption. And essentially, we also have this chloride bicarb transporter in the intestinal lumen. And so depending on what is used for the ileal conduit, what part of the GI tract, whether it's jejunum, ileum, uh, colon, stomach, these are the, the, the types of metabolic disturbances that you may see um, uh, that you may see uh, developed. So, and then you'll see them for most of them is hypochloremia, um, uh, um, and almost in all hypokalemia except in the jejunum, and then all, uh, universally in all of them, you'll see this metabolic acidosis. So a non-anion gap metabolic acidosis, again, due to this um, chloride bicarb transporter and the intestinal lumen. And so how do we treat this? Essentially, we just have to supplement bicarbonate back for the patient. You can calculate the deficit by this uh, simple equation, normal bicarb minus serum bicarb times the total body water, which is usually just 0.5. Um, and then that should give you the dose of how much uh, you should give. We, we, we sometimes use sodium bicarb tablets, but just know that sodium bicarb tablets are really large and they actually have very um, only like eight mil equivalents of bicarb per 650 milligram tablet. And so if a patient has a bicarb deficit of 50 mil equivalents, you're going to need a lot of sodium bicarb tablets to supplement that. And so it's, um, we like to use uh, something, a, a liquid of uh, sodium bicarb, uh, which is uh, uh, by Citra essentially. And so um, this is, uh, can be fairly straightforward to treat, but also very important so that the patients don't have, uh, don't develop a really severe acidosis. Then you get things like hyperkalemia and things like that as well. And with that, that will conclude a very brief um, overview about um, uh, basics of renal physiology for the urologist. Please send me your questions, um, anything that I could clarify. I know that I went to kind of fast in a lot of these, um, uh, a lot of these slides. And then um, just to um, finish off, if you don't wouldn't mind um, telling us what you think about our lecture, how I could improve it. And um, I really appreciate your attention. Thank you so much.